Recall that we defined a function last time from n to n, which has the effect of just taking the next of any natural number you give it. Now our goal is going to be to define some function that I'm going to call uh, fancy add, written like this. So just think of this as sort of one uh, think of this as one symbol for a constant. Um, and the way I want this to work is I want it to be a function uh, where when you give it a natural number like n, then it outputs for you another function. And then when you give that function a natural number like m, then it gives you m plus n where I haven't defined plus yet, but this is just what I want. So by m plus n, what I mean is take m and then next it n times. So keep applying next iteratively, and then the total number of nexts you should apply is you should apply n of them. So in other words, if you look at just add n, then what, what do I want that to be in the end? I want that to be a function that takes natural numbers and gives back natural numbers. And I want it to have the effect of applying next n times to things. So I want it to be uh, the function that adds n to things. So it's that, this is why it's called what it is called. Add n is going to be the function that adds n to things that nexts them n times. So we already have a function that nexts something once. That's this one. We have a function that uh, nexts something zero times. That's the identity function. Um, to, to, do, to apply zero of these, if I were to put zero here, would be basically to apply none of them, right? So it should be that uh, m just m goes in, m comes out. So the way add zero should work is that when you put in m, you should get m back out. So in other words, add zero should be the identity function. All right, so this is what we want. This is not quite a definition yet, but we can start building up a pattern and you'll see that it's a recursive pattern. So add zero, we'd like that to be the identity. That's how you add zero to things. So next something zero times, that's the identity. Next something one time, that's this function that we defined. And then what should, what should it mean to next something two times? Well, we've seen that if you compose this function with itself, then that is what that is, right? If you now apply add two to something, if you apply this composition to something, then it'll apply this and then apply this. So it'll next the thing and then it'll next it again, and so on. So add three will be this composed with this composed with this. And um, we have seen back here in theorem 61, uh, we have seen that composition is associative. So when you're composing things, even if they're not functions, just when you're composing any old sets of pairs, uh, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. Um, so it would actually be okay for me not to put parentheses here. But I'm putting them because um, I'm going to end up putting dot 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 here, which means I need to provide a recursion rule to make any sense of all this. And uh, I need to choose some way for my recursion rule to operate. So I'm going to choose that at each step, what the recursion rule is, is that at each step, to go to the next step, compose on the left by another one of these uh, adding one type functions. So. Here you can see the recursion rule. If you've got add n, and you want to know how to do add next n, so add n will be something, then what will add n be? Something in terms of what add, add n will be something, and what will add next n be? Well, something in terms of add n. So it'll be first add n, and then uh, do another next an additional next, then you're adding next n. 
So I want to say that uh, we have a starting point here and a recursion rule where at each stage this is happening. But it looks like we're not quite applying the recursion rule here, right? But we actually are. Um, to see how we are, uh, just apply it and observe that this is the same thing. When you compose something with the identity function, it leaves it unchanged. So here we really are. There's no harm in putting this here. So if you take the adding 0 function and you compose with an adding 1 function, then together we get an adding 1 function. Like this is the same as this. So what I'm getting at is just this, this principle here. Nothing to, special about natural numbers or adding or anything, just a basic fact about the identity. Um, and it's the reason we call it the identity. All right, so now it really does look like we have a starting point and a recursion rule. And each time we are applying this recursion rule that you see here. Um, but let's do this more carefully. So let me go back to uh, my notes here and back to how we actually apply theorems 107 and 108. Um, so we need to have a starting point which lives in a certain set and then a recursion rule which goes from that same set to the same set. So it's a mapping x to x. And then what uh, these theorems provide is a unique, a unique function from n, the natural numbers, to that set. So uh, I guess it would be nice to be perfectly clear about what my set x is in this situation. So uh, let's see. So remember I, I mentioned that whenever you have a function that has n as its domain, then that's called a sequence. And the set x is uh, the set in which the sequence is taking its values. So whatever the set x is, whatever, it's, whatever you call the uh, elements of the set, set x, that's what you say f would be a sequence of. So if x is the natural numbers, then you would say f is a sequence of natural numbers. If x is the set of real numbers, then f is a sequence of real numbers. What do we want a sequence of here? We want a sequence of these kinds of things. So a sequence where the zeroth term is this, the first term is, is this, the second term is this, and so on. What kinds of things are these? What would you say these are? Um, are they natural numbers? No. Are they real numbers? No, they're functions. Specifically, they're functions that map natural numbers to natural numbers. So the things you see on the right side of the equal sign here are all functions, you could say, of type natural to natural. So what I want from my set capital X in my application of theorem 107, what I want is for X to be a set of those kinds of things. So I'll say, let's let X be the set of all functions, let's call them F, mapping N to N. Okay, that's terribly confusing that I'm putting the bound variable f here since f is going to be the name of the sequence that comes out and I shouldn't refer to elements of x as, as f if I want to stay sane. So let me call it something different. How about g? Okay, so x is the set of g's that map n to n, the set of all functions that map n to n. then um, we want to let s be a certain thing and then we will ha we will observe note that s is in g uh, oh, sorry s is in x so our starting point should be in this set remember we're trying to build a sequence of of things that are in this set so our starting point the value of the sequence at zero should be in the set and then i should also describe r somehow and then hopefully at the end I can note that R maps X to X. That will be my recursion rule. So what will S be? What will the starting point be? Um, I don't know why I'm looking here. I should look up here. 
the starting point will be uh, identity. The starting point will be the identity on n, the function that adds zero to things, or rather it applies next zero times, so does nothing. And note that uh, if s is defined to be the identity, then that's an element of x. Do you agree? Yes, the identity on n does map n to n. Uh, actually, going back to our theorem about the identity, the identity on any set maps that set to itself. Okay, uh, what about r? So r will be a function from x to x. That's the goal. So let me describe r like this as a certain set of pairs. And let's see. Um, if you give me, well, let me come up with good variable names here. Um, what kind of things are usually input into R? So here, when I write this pair here, the, the pairs that are elements of R uh, are such that their first position corresponds to things being inputs of R, and the second position corresponds to the uh, associated output. So what kinds of things go into R? I want it to be that elements of X go into R. So functions of this type. So how about I call it G? That's a pretty good name. It'll be a bound variable in the end. Um, so let's say for G and X, filling that in. Then what should R do to G? What should R do to anything you input into it? Well, what is it that's happening from one step to the next? From one step to the next, you're composing on the left by this thing. So this is R. It maps G to G composed on the left with another uh, adding one type function. So this is kind of a not a very standard way for defining a function. Here's maybe a more familiar, more standard way to write things. Define R, mapping X to X, by R of G by this formula that r of g will be this composed with g for all g in x, meaning for all g mapping n to n. And then here I just say, well, note that r maps x to x. Is it really true that r maps x to x? Is that something I can note so quickly? I mean, that says three things. It says r is a function, the domain is x, and the range is contained in x. Well, if you, uh, we've seen before that if you define something by a formula, uh, running over all things in the domain, then uh, through uh, rewriting things like this and doing the usual argument that I think we did one last time or, or the pre time before that maybe, uh, you do end up with at least a function with the correct domain. So there's no trouble proving that this is a function of the correct domain. Where you might have some trouble is proving that the range of R is really a subset of X. Is the range of R a subset of X? That observation is needed so we can finally note that R maps X to X. Well, proving this amounts to uh, establishing that the output of R for any given input, G, that the output really does live in the set capital X. So the question is, if G is an X then is R, is R of G also in X? Or in other words, let me rephrase this, is this thing, which is what I'm saying, R of G is being defined to be in X. Okay, G in X, well that's just a different way of saying G maps N to N, right? So I'm really saying if g maps n to n, then is this in x? Again, in x just means maps n to n. So that's my question. So the question is the range of r a subset of x is this question. If g maps n to n, then is this composite a function mapping n to n? And here I'm going to go, uh, go back and reference this essence of composition. If you have you know, f mapping x to y, g mapping y to z, then the composite 
with when these match up, the composite maps from beginning to end. So here we have a situation where g would map n to n, and then our adding one function, we mentioned and proved last time that it maps n to n, so then the composite also maps n to n. So no, no problems there. Okay, so with all that work sort of out of the way, we now have, let me clear all this out of the way, we have now defined x to be this, s to be this, this is our starting point, and we observe s is really in x, and r is this, and we observe that r really does map x to x. We're now in a position to apply theorem 107, um, so, and 108, so we can uh, use these to define the unique uh, sequence, usually maybe called f in this theorem, but uh, we're going to call it add, and it'll be the unique sequence that has the uh, prescribed starting point here and recursion rule here. So define, now we can actually define add. Up top we were not defining it, we were just saying what we wanted it to do, right? You can do that in math, right? You can just say, oh, I want an object that does this and this and this, but that's not necessarily defining it. Um, you can write down any wishes, any wish list of properties that you want, but there might or might not be something that has those properties. Now we can actually define it. So define add, it'll be something from n to x. That's what is provided here by recursion. So to be, find it to be the unique unique function that satisfies uh, that add of 0 is is s, is the identity, and add of next n is the recursion rule applied to add of n. So meaning, the recursion rule applied to something, so what would this be? When r is applied to add n, this is what happens to add n. You get this composed on the left. So just like that. So now let's get let's get some of the clutter out of the way. Um, so I don't need to use the letters S and R for these things. I was just trying to bring those in to show you what's playing uh, what role in our use of recursion. Um, but in our definition, in the official definition, we can clean things up and only show what's needed. So we're going to define add from natural numbers to, okay, and here I confusingly use F, where here I was using G for the bound variable, but it's the same set, set of maps from N to N. And this will be the unique function that starts at the identity, and which uh, which takes the value at next n, which has its value at next n being its value at previous at, at n, composed with this thing on the left. Okay, so to add zero is to do nothing. To add one more than adding n, so to add next n, is to add n and then to apply another next after that. Okay, and um, the next definition finally introduces this symbol. So here we can, for the first time, start, start using the plus symbol. Um, so we really actually don't need this definition. We could totally just work with fancy add. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, we could always write add ba when we want to add two things. But this just looks nicer, right? It looks nicer and it looks a little bit more symmetric to us, uh, which is going to be uh, good partly because addition ends up being commutative. So we'll prove later that it doesn't matter what order you add things in. But right now, it, it, we have no reason to uh, just believe that right away. Okay, so anyway, uh, nicer notation is now introduced. So actually, in your work, you pretty much never act really need to use these, unless you're using the original definition of addition to prove something. But typically, um, you will have enough properties that we're about to prove soon of addition to uh, 
be able to stay in the world of just addition to do things. And you see this next theorem is an essence of theorem, um, which means uh, whatever we did to define addition, it was done to make these things true. And these are the main things that you will end up using uh, when you work with addition. So for the most part, when you work in theorem 113 here, this massive list of properties, for the most part, you're actually using the things here. You're not using the original definition. Okay, but we should prove this. We should prove that what we have worked hard to build here, add, uh, really does satisfy this, these like minimal starting conditions that we needed to satisfy. So let's, let's do that in the next video.